Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this very special event tonight uh, where we are going to be having a conversation between David Saff for Innovation. Uh, this event um, is kind of a special collaboration. It's part of our ongoing library um, and labyrinth live streaming events. Uh, I'm going to just tell you the background before I bring on our speakers is that uh, this is Jennifer Cohan, who runs Savory PR, uh, did a post on Facebook. She and I are Facebook friends and was promoting David's new book, The Soul of the Entrepreneur. And both uh, Fran McManus um, at Whole, Whole Earth Center and I commented, which then moved to a little messenger conversation. So turns out, you know, Jennifer and um, David are longtime friends from the foodie world and have kept in contact, close contact. So even though... Um, David lives up north of the border and Jennifer's down here in New Jersey. They are good friends. And as uh, David has just said in the comments, uh, Jennifer Cohan, the mitzvah maker. I like that. Um, we quickly then, um, you know, looped in Labyrinth and decided that we would do an event uh, where Jennifer from uh, Savory PR, Fran from the Whole Earth Center, as well as Dorotea from Labyrinth Books and the library would all get together uh, to make this event happen. And then of course, we needed to reach out to find the perfect discussant uh, for this event. And um, the first person that came to mind is the wonderful Derek from the uh, Keller Center, who speaks regularly at the library. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guests and let them take over this event. And I see everybody's popping online. Um, and, you know, um, it's an unusual time. We were just discussing in the green room to be holding an event like this with everything else that's going on in the world. Um, but maybe some normalcy to our days is is what's the salve that's needed. Um, but we we are well aware of what else is going on. Um, so we thank you for choosing to spend some time here with us tonight. And a uh, couple of housekeeping tips is at any point you can uh, click the this purchase button for Soul of an Entrepreneur. You can see the instructions there on how to get 10% off with free shipping or curbside pickup from Labyrinth Books. Um, there is an ask a question function and you can upvote the questions that you feel are the most prevalent or you can see what other people have asked. And, uh, Derek, and Der Derek and David have asked to keep the chat on so you can also chat with each other a little bit as the conversation is happening. And so uh, David Sachs is a writer, reporter and speaker who specializes in business and culture. His previous book, the Revenge of Analog was a number one Washington Post bestseller and was selected to be on the top 10 books of 2016 from the New York Times. And it has now been translated into six languages. He is also the author of Save the Deli, which won a James Beard Award, and The Tastemakers. In addition to writing books, he works as a freelance journalist and has written for publications such as New York Magazine, The New York Times, Sevier, NPR, and GQ, as well as Toronto Life. Speaking of Toronto, that is where he makes his home up north of the border, which is also um, makes me happy to have somebody here tonight uh, from my country of origin and my uh, just makes me feel nice to have a Canadian with me tonight. Uh, sorry, a little aside there. Uh, Derek Ladeau is the author of two books, Startup Leadership, How Savvy Entrepreneurs Turn Their Ideas into Successful Enterprise, and Building on Bedrock. What Sam Walton, Walt Disney, and other great self-made entrepreneurs can teach us about building valuable companies, which came out in 2018. He is also a frequent media commentator, as well as a faculty member at Princeton University, where he is the chair of the entrepreneur entrepreneurship faculty at the Keller Center. He is based in New York and right here in Princeton, New Jersey. So they are waiting online. I'm going to bring them up and activate their microphones. And uh, so welcome. Derek and welcome David. Yay. All smooth. I'm going to go into the background and let you two take it from here. We'll see you in a bit. Thank you. Hey, David. Um, hi, Derek. Good to see you. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, on a just another insane day in the world that we live in. Uh, but thank you for coming out. It really means a lot. Um, we will get deep into some conversation. Uh, but Derek, I, I got to say, it was, it was a real pleasure when they brought your name up as, you know, someone who could talk to me um, about this event, because I tried one of them without with just talking like this. And you're just, just talking to yourself in a mirror for 40 minutes. It 
psychologically not a very smart thing to do. Um, when they brought your name up, I was I was incredibly excited because we had a fantastic conversation when I interviewed you during the research for this book. Uh, and even though I didn't quote you because I'm a jerk. Um, <laughs> Hey, you cited my book. You know what it's like to write books. You got a hot thousand behind you. Uh, I cited the book. Um, your book was really instrumental in um, in the way I, I framed what I was thinking about uh, as I was writing this and our conversation uh, as well. So I'm really thrilled to continue it. Um, and now I'm going to stop talking for four seconds. And, and I was thrilled when your book came out and uh, I read it uh, literally uh, in the day after i received it uh thank you myself on my favorite book chair and it's a page turner which is uh you know the the highest compliment and and uh, but your book seemed really personal i mean I, I i would normally ask you about okay tell me why you wrote the book but this the, this was a different type of book it you know, you wrote it from your heart. How, yeah, the book was why did you write this book? I mean, that was <laughs> that was it. Um, sorry, there was so a question. why? Yeah. I mean, so, why? So how, how how is it so personal? Where where did it come from? I, I think it came from. There's two sort of areas, right? Professional and personal. And with entrepreneurship, it's that intersection of the two. Um, you know, professionally for the, I don't know, nearly two decades that I've been a journalist, I've always been interested in the stories of entrepreneurs. Uh, I wrote about them when I was writing business stories for Business Week and New York Magazine and other places. Uh, I never wrote about big corporations. I never wrote about big companies. I always wrote about individual small businesses, medium-sized businesses, but it was always focused on that personal sort of story. Um, the first book I wrote was about called the save the deli was about the Jewish delicatessen business. Mm -hmm. So places like hobbies in, um, in Newark and, um, and other, you know, delis in, in Philly. And, you know, again, it's like the most personal approach to a business, um, is a place where someone's name is on the sign with an apostrophe on it. Uh, and, and everything that I've really written since then, you know, has been that about entrepreneurs. And a couple of years ago, starting when I lived in New York and it was during the Great Recession, cute name, um, uh, I, I started looking into stories that I never ended up writing. I could never sell them to my editors about people starting businesses and what that meant. So there was something I was, I was I wanted to get at something and I kept writing stories that were on the periphery of it. And a couple of years ago, I just started having conversations. I think I was having a conversation with someone about a podcast and we were in a coffee shop and I was like, well, what are all these people doing here? And we went around and started interview asking them and they each one told about a different business they were starting or running. And it was, it seemed like it was this golden age for entrepreneurs. Um, and that's started growing this curiosity of like, there's something going on. There's some change in the way we're talking about entrepreneurs, the way that entrepreneurs are being, portrayed the language you're using about them there's like a zeitgeist there's a sexiness to it mm -hmm. um and and that to me was really relevant because i've always worked for myself i've always considered myself an entrepreneur my father has always worked for himself he really considers himself an entrepreneur my mother had her own business my wife just started her own business my brother whose apartment i'm in was starting a business so it was like this family continuation there was something about being an entrepreneur working for yourself that was really central and so I, you know, I just started, I don't know, playing around with this idea and Princeton Connection. Uh, my friend Gregory Kaplan was teaching in the economics department there. He's since moved on to the University of Chicago to do horrible things with Milton Friedman's ideas. Um, uh, that's a dig. That's like a Princeton wahoo dig. Um, anyway, Greg, Greg was teaching in, in Princeton and we had breakfast in New York one day and I was telling him about this idea. We were just, sh you know, sharing what we're up to. And I was like, yeah, I want to write a, a book about the golden age of, you know, working for yourself and freelancing self-employment. Um, he's like, oh, you're talking about entrepreneurs. I was like, yes, entrepreneurs. It's the golden age of entrepreneurs. Look at all the startups. Mm -hmm. It's never been easier to start a business, never been more lucrative to start a business. Look at all the co-working spaces. Look at the WeWorks, look at the ads for the co-working spaces. Like there's something going on. Look how Elon Musk has become the sex symbol and 
And every celebrity we know is now becoming an entrepreneur. Like this is the golden age of entrepreneurship and I want to chronicle it. And he said, okay, but you know, is it? And I was like, yes, of course. Look at all the, look at all the startups. Look at George Clooney's tequila company and Heidi Klum's lingerie company. And you know, the cover of entrepreneur magazine and fast company and Inc. Like this is this golden age of entrepreneurs. He goes, okay, sure. Let me look into that for you. And he sends me, these reports from, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and um, uh, various other organizations that actually look at the actual data, which as a kind of anecdotal studs turkle type journalist, I don't tend to do. Um, but it was in incredibly eye opening because what it showed was the exact opposite, that if you measured entrepreneurship by, let's say the most common measure that we all would think of, which is people who start a business. In America, that number had been declining in the 40 years since I had been born um, and was at a sort of all time low. And when you looked at it from other different numbers as well that mattered, uh, the number of people those new businesses employed, the ability of those startups to grow, the amount of capital that went to them, uh, all of that was declining. So on the one hand, you had this cultural perception of entrepreneurship at its absolute zenith. And on the other hand, the statistics showing that entrepreneurship in America and in much of the Western world was actually at a nadir. Um, and that contradiction really got me interested because it, it gave a window into something that was happening now, which allowed me to answer that bigger question, you know, of what it actually means to be an entrepreneur. Well, it sounds like you, you, you wound up writing a book that was the exact opposite of what you anticipated when you were speaking with your economist friend. And, uh, and that, that I think really comes through in your opening introduction chapter to the book, which you, you title Myth. And um, you, you really lay into the 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 myth of the hero entrepreneur and the myth of entrepreneurship being easier now than ever and the myth of of all this prosperity that's being created by the entrepreneurs that's that's and and then you paint a completely different picture from there but boy that also your your introduction is so personal in in really having at it you know yeah i i, I think I mean, you know the subtitle of the book is is work and life beyond the startup myth mm -hmm. and so when i when i started looking into okay there's this there's this contradiction between the mythology around entrepreneurship that we've come to believe um and the reality of it, which is actually more troubling, well, what is that myth? I want to tackle it head on and, and pick it apart. And I very quickly saw that it was the Silicon Valley startup myth, which has captured entrepreneurship academically, culturally, um, in many ways financially, for much of the past two decades. And when someone says the word entrepreneur, they think of Zuckerberg, they think of Musk, they think of Jobs. Um, when, you know, Ernst and Young or whoever is handing out their Entrepreneur of the Year awards is typically going to the startup. People, people equated entrepreneurship with startups and startups represented a tiny outlier slice of what most entrepreneurship represented. How did it come to dominate that so completely? And what were the, the problems with that? What were the issues, um, that that myth perpetrated and, and push forward, what were the consequences of that? So, um, it, you know, it, it was this kind of amorphous thing and 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 I wanted to move beyond it, but I, I had to sort of tackle out, tackle where it came from and, and, and how it happened um, and what it actually represented. And it was, it was very interesting. I mean, I think probably half the interviews for this book were just for that first chapter. The first chapter is extremely long um, and I cut it down by half. That was where you're part came out. Sorry, Derek. Uh, <laughs> but um, it, it's essential to sort of lay the groundwork of what we're talking about. Because yeah, I could have written a book about entrepreneurs and here's what they look like. But 
you know, it's editors always have to say, why now? Why is this relevant now? It's, mm-hmm. And I think it was because we had reached the apex of this fairy tale mythology. You're a bright, young, brilliant Ivy League dropout who, you know, creates something in their dorm room and makes billions of dollars and changes the world and starts an ecosystem and does better. And all you have to do is repeat that and we can solve all the problems of our economy, of our society, of our politics. Woohoo, we're going to change the world. Um, uh, but that mythology was in many ways false and in, in, in increasing ways troubled. Uh, and the more I dug into it, the more I saw what that looked like and how we needed to move beyond that. So, so what was your process to, to have, have that starting proposition and then gather all, okay, um, talking to academics who yeah. often don't know what they're talking about, but, uh, and then finding these entrepreneurs to illustrate your, your points that had to have evolved from that process and then weave it all together into a, a coherent and compelling uh, narrative, you know, that, that just flows beautifully from, from you know, beginning to oh its God. wonderful end. Thank God you think that. Yeah. Thank. So, so what, what was the process? You know, how did it work? Why did you organize the book the way you did? And yeah. Did it I, the chaos in my mind. I mean, I, you know, this is that point where it's where I, when people say, do you consider yourself an entrepreneur? It's like, well, I have the complete freedom to dictate that process for better or worse. And in many ways, the, the risk that comes along with that and the freedom of that was at points, you know, torturous. I mean, I, I lost more sleep writing and researching this book than I have in any other book that I've previously done because the immensity of the topic is just gigantic. And where do you begin and where do you, how do you organize it? Um, I knew that I didn't want to write a book about how to become an entrepreneur, how to succeed as an entrepreneur, how to build a company. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't possibly tell anyone. I wanted it to be about why why people become entrepreneurs and what that looks like. So much more of the emotional aspect, the soul, right? Uh, and then I and then I kind of asked myself, what are the things that illustrate that, right? What are the what are the different reasons why? Uh, for someone, it's community. For someone else, it's starting over. For someone, it's uh, a lifetime of ideas. Um, and then who would be the people that could illustrate that as sort of these main characters? But beyond that, what are the myths around those motivations that I want to dispel? Uh, and, it, and that went back to that sort of startup myth, because the startup myth is one narrative arc about entrepreneurship that many people have bought into is the sort of only one that matters, right? You want a founder that's young, you want them to be brilliant, they have to, you know, uh, create something that has the potential to be a brilliant company, and they go for, you know, a C round, and then a series A, series B, C, exit, and so on, and they're a success or a glorious failure, and they go on to start the next thing. Um, But that left out all sorts of different uh, narratives, and I wanted to to tell those ones um, about the different reasons why people become entrepreneurs, about what those entrepreneurs look like, um, why they do what they do, uh, and again, how that mythology, which is taken by some to be the be all and end all, is actually false. So, um, so who doesn't get put into that myth? Okay, you know, people of color, women. All right, I want a chapter about you know, an African-American woman who is a successful entrepreneur because she is someone that never gets her story told in, you know, uh, the best-selling startup books. And yet African-American women and minority women are the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in America. Um, I wanted an entrepreneur who was older. I wanted someone in their, their 70s because while the mythology of Zuckerberg in his dorm room or Musk in his dorm room with PayPal or Jobs not even going into a dorm room because he was too busy taking acid and and, uh, walking around barefoot and starting Apple. Um, The majority of successful founders of high tech businesses are 45 years old on average, which includes a lot of people in their 60s and 70s. Um, So I wanted to broaden the scope to show the the diversity and the vibrancy of entrepreneurship, um, not just by the backgrounds of the entrepreneurs I focused on, but 
you know, again, what it means to them. Because for each entrepreneur, it's different. For the startup myth, it, it tends to be the same. It's I wanted to change the world and build the biggest company I could and be the most successful. And that's fine. That's a legitimate thing. But it's a legitimate thing for a very small number of people and entrepreneurs. Well, it's really clear that you love these people. I mean, your 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 first chapter, which uh, I mean, once you get into the entrepreneurs, just your second chapter, right, was Im immigration and entrepreneurship, and and you tie it to the Syrian restaurants that are popping up all over Toronto and elsewhere in Canada, and and these are p people that you hang out with and uh, and you love hearing their story. I mean, it just yeah. comes through. That, you I mean, know, eat enough baklava made by someone, you'll, you know, you're not going to say anything like bad about them. <laughs> yeah, tremendous baklava. Yeah. I, I mean, I think this is what's always drawn me to, to writing about entrepreneurs and why I never liked writing about big corporations or public companies. I would meet some, you know, public relations person and they would be standing by me the whole time and I couldn't ask real questions of someone. Um, uh, and, and when I would meet an entrepreneur who owned their own business, it was, it was this intimate look into someone's deep personal life through business, but so much of our life is happens through our work. Uh, and so of course I, I, I empathize with them and built relationships with them. And that was regardless of who they were. I mean, some of the most interesting conversations that happened for this book were, um, with businessmen like rock solid Republican bedrock, as you wrote in your book, like bedrock Republican businessmen in the suburbs of Philadelphia who, you know, had defense contractor companies and talking about what it meant to these gentlemen um, who were in many ways kind of the opposite of me um, in, in sort of a lot of our personal values, what it meant for them to sell their companies to their employees and having them sit there and tear up in front of me. I mean, it's it's this wonderful experience that I would never get, you know, writing about someone who was the CFO of, I don't know, Boeing or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's this immediate sort of one-on-one -on -one personal humanity when you talk to people about being entrepreneurs because it's such a personal and human endeavor, right? We We study it as though it's a unit of economic input and output but it's so entirely personal. And I think that was the way that I wanted, that was the only way I was gonna approach it, but that was kind of the way that worked. Yeah, and and the spectrum of characters that you talk about, I mean, I call them characters, but each one's an They're individual- They're real people, I didn't that, make them up, yeah. That, 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 that has a, a passion that involves, you know, delivering happiness to other people. And, and that being, what they dedicate their lives to. And now it may be for for personal reasons so that they can go surfing most mornings off of Rockaway Beach or whatever. But um, but you came up with such a, a, you know, appropriate spectrum. How did you find these characters? I mean, first of all, it, it was intentional, right? I wanted to make sure that I reflected the diversity of entrepreneurship because while we see in Fast Company and, and Business Week and titles I've written for, right? Who makes the cover? It's usually young white guys uh, that went to Harvard or Stanford, maybe Princeton. Um, uh, I'm not slagging on Princeton. Yeah, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I could have never gotten in there. It's okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the reality when you look at the demographics of who entrepreneurs are across America reflects very much the demographics of who Americans are or Canadians or Britons or Japanese or whoever, right? Um, and that is urban and rural, wealthy and poor minorities and Caucasian, you know, highly educated and completely uneducated. And all of their stories are legitimate. It's a legitimate reflection. I'm not, I wasn't writing a book about just successful entrepreneurs, which probably would have narrowed that down. I wanted a, a sort of diverse cast to show that diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and also what linked them all together, regardless of whether you were a, you know, white multimillionaire um, defense contractor outside Philadelphia, or, you know, an African American woman with a hair salon in New Orleans, or a Syrian refugee with literally arrived with $5 in his pocket um, three years ago and, and scraped together money to buy a bakery.
Um, uh, but you know, how I found some of them, I mean, some were very easy. Like there was a Syrian bakery that I saw opening up a block from my kid's school in Toronto. And I was like, oh, perfect. Okay, great. And others were really torturous to find. It was, um, okay, I want of someone who is an entrepreneur that is shaped by their personal values, but they came to it later. They didn't start their business around their values. And I don't want like the yoga mat it's made out of recycled water bottles or the water bottles made out of recycled yoga mats or some other company started on Kickstarter in Boulder, Colorado. That would be so obvious. You could sort of dismiss it. I wanted the opposite of that. I wanted like the, you know, Mitt Romney style Republican, like average American shirt sleeve rolled up businessman who you wouldn't associate with those sorts of values and yet could speak about it deeply. And it took me months to find those people. Uh, I would have, I had dozens of conversations with people at different organizations that were based around, you know, linking different companies and CEOs and entrepreneurs together and their value base and they had their credos and the business. And they're like, oh, you got to talk to Mike. Call up Mike. He owns a metal fabrication business in Chicago. It supplies some part that makes the inflatable air things that go inside a package you get from Amazon. You know, he's doing really well. Someone says, oh, he's all about his values. He's totally about Talk to Mike. Hey, oh, what are you doing? Okay, I'm doing this book. Okay, yeah. So tell me about your values. List the values. Oh, integrity, this, that, that, like laundry list, 12 values. Great. Okay. So how have those changed your businesses? Like, could you give me one concrete example of how your business has been shaped and you as an entrepreneur have put the, your personal values into the business and actually changed something of the way you do business? Well, every month we find the best employee and we give them a bobblehead. <laughs> Okay. Is there any other way, Mike? Like, is there any other sort of thing? Well, at the end of the year, the one who gets voted the most gets tickets to the Hard Rock Cafe and a limo. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, and it just took ages to find until someone said, oh, have you thought about ESOPs? And I was like, what's an ESOP? It's like, well, it's this way that entrepreneurs can sell the company that they've created and they own to their employees as sort of benefit plan. It doesn't always work. Lehman Brothers had one, Enron had one, but in the right cases, if someone's doing the right thing, it's a very concrete thing. And that led me to Kevin Mauger in the suburbs of Philadelphia, because I met some lawyer who did ESOPs in Philly, like just random chains of endless frustrated phone calls and emails until finally you find the right person and you know you wake up in a hotel in Philadelphia and you're like, okay, I really hope this guy's got something for me otherwise. <laughs> I got nothing, but you know, they, wow. they end up, everyone has a story to tell. Yeah. And, 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 but that got Princeton a walk on in your book, you know, with uh, you being a drive for, for a yeah. conference. I drove up, I drove up from Philly, you know, went to one like 40 minute meeting at a Marriott um, with a bunch of different Princeton area ESOP owners. Uh, again, who were really interesting. Like one woman, uh, I think it was Informatica, I think they were called. Um, Mathematica. And it was, and it's, you know, a about how to, you know, best use information for public service. And she said, you know, the people who run this company and own it are like die hard leftist socialists. And we're sharing the table with this other company that made cable and all three founders were like born again christians and the the man was like well the reason i did this is because you know jesus said this on the mount and like and and this is what christ would want me to do and you know had like the trump bumper sticker on his car i mean it was this incredible collection of people that just happened to bring me there um just for that one you know for five paragraphs in a book um but again, you know, showing that like the diversity of entrepreneurship isn't just a diversity of faces, it's a diversity of ideas and ideals that doesn't get represented very often. But hey, you also have characters like Jessica Dupar. Yeah. Which somebody has to do a, a movie or a TV series. Yeah. Her. Oh, I'm she, sure. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, you're not going to put down the book when you're reading about Jessica. Dupin. No, no, I could have written the whole book about her. It probably would have sold better. Um, and, and Jessica was a random, again, a random find. I, 
as I said, I knew I wanted to write uh, at least one chapter about an African-American woman who's an entrepreneur because they're the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs, and yet they're tremendously underrepresented, um, tremendously underserved. I mean, you know, everything that's going on in the nation right now talking about inequality, you know, African-American women might be the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs. They're also the least likely to get funding. I'm not talking about just venture capital funding, which, of course, they don't get. Uh, I'm talking about a bank loan you know, anything. Um, their businesses are the least capitalized for a African-American woman with a hair salon. Their average revenue is like $18,000 for a white woman with a hair salon is about $56,000. Um, uh, so it was important to me. And I knew that the hair and beauty business is what I wanted to write about because historically, even going back to slave times, um, uh, Afro black women in America have turned to sort of hair and beauty as, as their way out with the, one of the first female millionaires in America, Madam CJ Walker. I don't know if you've seen the Netflix series, you know, she created that on, on hair care products and it was always stood for something more. It stood for community. It stood for a way of pulling yourself out of poverty, but also bringing up your community with you. And so I was going to new Orleans for uh, giving a talk at a conference. I was like, well, New Orleans is a, you know, very prominently African-American city, long history of, of you know, entrepreneurship and, and especially in the beauty business. I'm going to find someone. I called around like a bunch of places and development banks and I got someone on the phone. He's like, oh, you should check out uh, Jessica Depart. She's doing, she's like really, you know, getting big. And I, you know, called up her business and I spoke to her for five minutes. She's like, yeah, sure, come on down. Like, when are you coming? Okay, I'll set aside some time that day. And what I didn't realize was I caught her, who, who she's a tremendous character. She has over a million and a half followers on Instagram or titled The Real BB Judy. BB stands for Big Butt. Like she makes, she, you know, she looks and dresses like an LOL doll with anyone who's a parent of young girls, you'll know what the hell an LOL doll is. Um, she's tremendously over the top in her online persona and an incredibly savvy businesswoman. And yet, you know, here's someone who started cutting hair and her parents, like bathroom when she would sneak in girls from high school who would hide in the shower if any of her parents had to go to the bathroom. Um, uh, and, and, you know, started working in salons and hair braiding places and just built it up until finally she started selling hair products and, and, and making these videos online and they started doing really successful. And I caught her right at this moment when things were turning from like, oh, you're pretty big in New Orleans to suddenly becoming this national figure. Um, she's huge now. I mean, now she's a multimillionaire. She just bought some compound outside Atlanta. If you go on Instagram, you'll see her driving around in like a giant pink golf cart. Um, but she also leads tours of seminars um, about being an entrepreneur and becoming an entrepreneur um, for other thousands of African-American women will go to every year. She kind of is a leader in her community and she just kind of happened into it. Um, and it was, you know, incredible. And it was funny because, you know, people say, oh, that's the best, most engaging chapter of the book and nothing happened. Like we drove around New Orleans for a day and a half. And like the most exciting thing is when we went to her accountant's office and he's, he's like, did you get these 1099 pay slips? Like when you went to Atlanta and did this video and she's like, young Jeezy isn't going to sign a 1099. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to repeat the words she said here, but she's like, these are hood beep. Um, but you know, like that was it, like nothing else happened. She had a few meetings and a few phone calls. We had a lot of conversations, but you know, her story, I think to a lot of people who read this book really stood out because it's a story that you don't necessarily read in a book about entrepreneurs or a business book, right? She represents the story of most fairly successful African-American women in the hair business. It's not that different from many of the other women that are out there building these companies are semi-successful ones. Um, but I think just because it it's so different from what we've typically been talking about around entrepreneurs that, um, that, it, that it stood up, but she is, you know, yeah, the movies, I'm not going to tell you that Hollywood hasn't already <laughs> asked about it. Um, but who knows Hollywood. Yeah. But yeah. So, You know, it, this has to be a, a, a really challenging time to bring out a book. You know, uh, <laughs> or be a human, right? Or be a what? human. Yeah. But, but it's even more so to be an entrepreneur, particularly yeah. the entrepreneurs you describe, right? So this is a wipeout 
a, a complete wipeout. An extinction event. Yeah, someone yeah. else called it. Yeah. Uh, for, for this entire, you know, species, subspecies of person that you have so lovingly described. And, and you know, you, you can't help but your gut, you know, wrenches up as you're reading and you're thinking, but all of these people are, you know, out of business or sitting on the sidelines or destroyed. And they didn't have all that much, you know, in the bank to start with. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, the timing, I mean, this book came out on April 20th. So really at the absolute height of the pandemic in the United States and the, the start of this depression that we're in. Um, and, and we saw from day one that this was going to hit small business owners and entrepreneurs a lot harder than, than most. Um, and that was from, you know, the day where it's like, all right, close your businesses. It's like, what? Yep. Close your businesses. And most just went and did it because they knew that was the right thing to do. Um, and so, you know, in a way, yeah, it was, it's, it's been challenging to release a book to say the least. Um, but the book has become the, the topic has become more relevant because I think while we were talking over the past 15, 20 years about the value of entrepreneurs in terms almost explicitly related to technology startups, fast growing startups, venture capital funding, and so on. What we're seeing now is the greater value of a broad base of entrepreneurs that they have in our lives. When we walk down the streets of Princeton or here in Toronto, where I live, and we see these closed businesses, and we wonder if they're going to reopen. And if they don't, how long is it going to be till someone opens another business in that vacant storefront or industrial area or whatever? we see that the value of entrepreneurs to our lives, to our communities is far more than just, oh, well, they employ some people and they pay some taxes, which was sort of the argument that that was being really pushed, especially in academia, right? Uh, well, we need, you know, the, the only entrepreneurs that matter are, are the ones who can grow the fastest growing companies because those are the ones who can employ the most people and that's what we need are jobs. It's like, okay, well, we also need bookstores in our communities like labyrinth to sell us books and give us things places to take our kids we need restaurants um not only that will give us uh, you know explicit numbers of calories but that we can build our lives around we can have the place that we go to on a sunday and the place we go to on birthdays um the place that you know we know i mean it's very jane jacobs right it's the fabric of our communities and these entrepreneurs play a role in it and i think we only realize that importance through this crisis um and we're increasingly seeing that the push to buy local the 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 fact that a lot of the early response to problems in communities whether it's feeding people who are hungry getting food to those who are isolated like elderly residents um, or immunocompromised residents providing entertainment for children uh, or you know, I don't know, some lifeline for parents like me who are stuck at home with them um, has not come from the big companies. It's come from those individual entrepreneurs in our communities, in our backyards, our friends, our relatives, our neighbors. Um, and so, you know, while, yeah, it's been challenging to sell the book and I, I don't, I'm not even worried about how well it's selling because I don't think it's the least problems in the world right now. So I'm not going to complain about this, but it's it's given me and certainly an urgency in writing about this because the core message of the book is really about why entrepreneurship matters and why it matters now more than ever. And I think one of the things is that value to community. And the other is, you know, as we come out of this, um, the, I don't know, what, 40 million Americans who are unemployed now? Who knows what, what that number is going to be in a week. Um, they're not going to have jobs to go back to. Most of them won't. And so a lot of them are going to have to look to entrepreneurship as their best option. And that doesn't make them any less valuable as entrepreneurs than the graduate of Stanford who goes on to get a, you know, Excel funded um, a VC startup. In many ways, it's better. I mean, I remember in, in building on Bedrock, you're, you're, 
your great book that I read that at least one or two of them started their businesses in, in the depression, right. Or were forced to start their business because they had a kid or something like that. Was it Waltman? I, I tear. I should have picked up the book <laughs> tonight, but I was busy dealing with my children. Um, uh, and so you're going to see what you're going to see and everybody's predicting is a surge in the number of people who become entrepreneurs. Um, some out of choice, some out of necessity. And I'm seeing it already. My cousin lost her job at Deloitte a month ago. She's starting a company that cleans automated, uh, automated cleaning service for wheelchairs in, in long-term care homes because her father's in a long-term care home. She knows how important that is. I have another friend who had a travel business that clearly isn't happening. And so he pivoted to doing backyard gardening and whole kits of backyard gardens, and he's growing it really quickly. There are there is actually tremendous opportunity out there for entrepreneurs right now. And, and many entrepreneurs I know who either had a business or lost a job or just think that now is the right time to do it are moving forward with it. And so I think it is a difficult and challenging time for most entrepreneurs. But, you know, I, I like to say there's never a good time to be an entrepreneur. There's never a bad time to be an entrepreneur. It's just yeah. time to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> I love the fact that you also took it outside the United States and Canada. And uh, you had your one chapter about family businesses where you use, uh, you know, wine families from, from Argentina. But what, what you're saying applies equally well or more so. Um, outside the United States. It's everywhere. I mean, yeah. this is the thing, right? You, you know, you go, you know, I used to live in Argentina and, and Brazil and I started as a journalist. So that's how I met Adu and I used to write for Wine Spectator. So that's how I knew those people. Um, but, you know, I remember writing an article for a food magazine years ago about beach food vendors in Rio. So all these people lived in the favelas and the slums of Rio. And I was interviewing them about their businesses, their you know, the the cans of iced tea that they carried on a cooler on their back through the hot sand or the guy who had the the bicycle mounted popcorn maker and he would make fresh popcorn in this contraption built on a bicycle. And they spoke about their businesses with the same hope and passion and ingenuity and pride as people who had founded multi-million dollar companies that I'd interviewed or people who ran you know, super successful restaurants. Um, it is a universal human story and experience. Yeah. And, I, you know, it's not something for everyone. Around, you know, 10% of people in developed countries will go and work for themselves. Yeah. But um, but when you speak to entrepreneurs, there is something that's common about them. Uh, and that's sort of what I wanted to get at. Well, you really did a fabulous job, you know. Thank you. Um, I, I think your message message comes through loud and clear, and and although you didn't intend it, your message is more important now than ever. Yeah, it's um, you know wonderful, terrible timing. Yeah. <laughs> I would have preferred that it wasn't yeah. due to the circumstances. Not yeah, not yeah. only do we need to go out and buy your book and read it, but yeah. we need to go and you know support our local entrepreneurs. Absolutely, yeah. If if and, and, and they're so different. The, our local entrepreneurs are the ones who really care, and it's not those vapid television commercials that make you know big we companies feel like yeah. they're uh, feeling your pain right now, which are hard to watch. Yeah, and, and that's it. I mean, it's it is you know what is the community you want? What is, what are the values that you have for your community? So if it's Princeton or New York City, that. I remember talking to Greg Gage, the commissioner of small business in New York City, he said, yeah, you know, we have chain stores. You go, go to Soho, go to go to Times Square, go to, you know, the outer boroughs and, and, and some mall. Like we have Costco, we have Target, we have all these things. That's not what makes New York City, New York City. New York City is made by its small businesses, by the, the you know, diamond merchants on 47th Street and um, all the the independent restaurants and parts of Brooklyn and the hair salons in, in bed and, and the places to get a tight in, you know, um, even the guys who, you know, do tire service under the BQE. It's, it's that constellation of businesses, that ecosystem to borrow a term from the world of startups 
that that make a community what it is. Um, and you need all of it. You can't just build it out of you know the next Amazon or Twitter in your backyard and then having this trickle down effect. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, and and Amazon started as a tiny business. Every all businesses business, start every small. Business yeah, starts as a tiny business. And so if if that's doesn't exist, you've destroyed the soil that's going to, you know, ultimately keep the planet being a wonderful place to live. Yeah, that's a beautiful metaphor, Derek. So, um, well, I think there's some questions uh, that have been asked. And you can ask a question in the ask a question box. Mm -hmm. um, not in the chat box. Uh, so if you just click in the ask a question box, okay. you can ask. So um, do you believe too many people are planning to start their own business as an escape from corporate America? Uh, I, what, how do you define too many people? I don't know. I mean, I think, look, at any given time, you know, uh, this crisis aside, which we're going to, you know, this upends everything. But let's say February, say, um, uh, the blissful ignorance of February. Uh, you know, about one in 10 Americans would be working for themselves. Um, so why do the other nine in 10 not do it? Because entrepreneurship is not for everyone. It means doesn't mean that everyone can't do it if they need to, um, but it's not something that everybody's willing to do because it comes with two things and this is the two things that every entrepreneur gets whether they're bill gates or whether they're bill whoever um uh and that's freedom and risk the freedom to sort of work in the way you want the work with your ideas to build the thing that you want to build in the way that you decide to wear whatever clothes you want to wear to work where you want to you know whatever you want to do you have a complete and total freedom of that and you don't have to ask permission of anyone to do that um uh, which is the intoxicating thing that most people sort of dream about. But that freedom is inseparable from the risk, the financial risk that you could blow it all and lose all your money and lose your house and whatever. Um, uh, but also the emotional risk and the psychological risk, the risk to your identity, the risk that you get so tied up in what you're doing and your job that um, uh, you can lose it both when things are good and your ego just takes over and you see yourself as some sort of godlike figure uh and when times are bad and you can't divorce yourself as an individual from the business that you have which might be troubled which you're seeing a lot now um and so you know look right now i mean i doubt anyone who's working a well-paid satisfying job in corporate america is ready to jump ship in this economy um i think there's a lot of talk about that and a lot of misperception about that in the past decade especially with younger individuals you know there was this prediction that millennials don't want to work for anyone they want to be independent they want to be freelance millennials are going to be the most entrepreneurial generation and this is one of those myths that just was completely false um millennials are actually the least likely generation to go out and become entrepreneurs um so just because they look like you know, they have someone like Zuckerberg in their ranks. There was this assumption that, well, all the millennials want, look, you know, look at all the WeWorks, they're filled with millennials. Um, but the opposite was true because that risk is not for everyone. And I think a lot of it comes from circumstance and a lot of it comes from privilege too, right? Um, Zuckerberg had, you know, he did, he came from a pretty well off family. And, and so he was okay at Gates too. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs do. Um, that risk is different for everyone else. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the people who are going to become entrepreneurs are the ones who become entrepreneurs because it, there's something illogical that's calling them to do it. Something that's beyond just numbers. It's, it is, it is that emotional thing. But an interesting fact that, that um, is, is unfortunately lost is that although uh, only slightly more than 10% of the population uh, at any one time are entrepreneurs, half the population will try to become an entrepreneur at some time during their working career. Oh, interesting. So I'm going to take that. Yeah. So 
one and two are going to try. Yeah. And they may not realize it. <laughs> no. And and they may not, you know, they may not get past just writing stuff down and thinking about it and talking about it for various different reasons, of which are perfectly logical. If you have a good job and, you know, in the United States, you got to think about healthcare. We don't have to do that here in Canada. Um, uh, and you have a family like it, you know, it's a risk. It is a tremendous it, it can be a tremendous risk based on what it is you're doing. I think it is you know, like all freedom, it's this intoxicating thing. Everybody wants to shake off that yoke of employment in some sense, whether they actually do it or not, you know, depends on, on who they are. If there's someone like me who never even entered into it. And at this point in my life, I mean, forget it, you know, not only will no one ever hire me for anything, but, um, I, I could never, I would never even consider it. Yep. Another question do you have any advice for a college freshman who wants to become an entrepreneur? I mean, I think the give is think broadly, first of all, about what being an entrepreneur means. Um, if you're only wondering whether you can be the next reincarnation of Steve Jobs and you're reading, you know, all the startup books that you have, you're looking at it pretty narrowly. Being an entrepreneur essentially just means having the freedom to work for yourself. And that can take on all sorts of different meanings and different ways. And you have to find the one that's true to you. So you may not want to build the next billion dollar company. You might want to build a wonderful lifestyle business that allows you to indulge in your hobbies or have, you know, fun with the family or spend more time doing charitable work or, or, or something else. Right. Um, uh, Educate yourself about the broad realities of what being an entrepreneur could be. Um, talk to the entrepreneurs that you know in your own life. Don't just wait for Princeton to bring in the CEO of some super fantastic cor corporation, which is probably a lot of, of what they do, because that's who the people like. Do you have a cousin? Do you have a family member who owns their own business. Talk to them what that's like. That's going to be much more indicative of the reality of the entrepreneur that you're probably going to be than um, than the person that that gets the 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 to, to go in the lecture circuit um, and and use that to sort of figure out what what it is. And then I think the most important thing is for every entrepreneur at every stage of their their career, whether you're, you know, 20 something or whether you're 40 something like me or whatever age is having a firm understanding of why you're doing it. Um, we'd all like to make a billion dollars. I'd love to write a number one New York times bestselling book, but Malcolm Gladwell is still alive. And so that's not happening for a while. Plus a thousand other people. <laughs> then, uh, so I have come to realize that my reason for doing it is the freedom to do the work. It's the freedom to have the conversations with people that I would never be able to have to go to New Orleans and spend, you know, five days in African American hair salons talking about women and learning about what they're doing. And then to be able to take those ideas and express them in my words and my thoughts without anyone telling me how or how not to do it. Um, that's the reward. If I can make enough money doing that to pay my mortgage, send my kids to, I don't even have to pay for daycare anymore because all the schools are closed. Um, but, you know, pay for, you know, sustain my lifestyle. Like that to me is, is my vision of success. What is, what is yours? What is your reason to want to become an entrepreneur? Um, and because that's the thing that's going to sustain you when things are difficult. And when you have the inevitable ups and downs of an entrepreneur career in any field and in any economy in any time, um, it's sort of, you know, getting in touch with yourself about that and knowing that the earlier on you can, the better. So there's, uh, uh this question, uh, that starts by thanking you for coming to talk that. Absolutely. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still at home. I'm a block from my house. Right. Can you speak a bit to the difference between being an entrepreneur in a huge city like Toronto versus being an entrepreneur in a small town like Princeton uh, or even maybe more rural? And I know you had a whole chapter that was out in Fresno. And yeah, not even it, Fresno. Turlock it, makes it, Fresno Turlock. look like um, Beverly yeah. Hills. Yeah. Is, is there a demographic shift towards cities like the general population or is the churn of businesses falling to make uh, high city rents pushing them out 
to the it's about it's both, right? It is that that cyclical effect. I mean, you have across the world, you know, a continuous migration of people from urban or rural areas to urban areas where there's m- bigger markets, more customers, more opportunities. Um, uh, and you do see a decline of entrepreneurship in rural areas in the U S and North America, all over, um, you know, especially with farms, farmers are entrepreneurs and they're some of the hardest working, riskiest entrepreneurs who are incredibly tied, not only to their work, but their identity as dairy farmers, for example, as I wrote about in the book or, or ranchers, as I wrote about, you know, in that same chapter, um, Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the differences are going to be on the surface related to cost, right? Toronto is a very expensive city. The price of rent was everything to everybody right before this. I mean, that was it. The cost of licensing, you know, a place like New York City as well. And you can make up for that in the size of the market and the prices you can charge, but not as much. Um, But I think, again, as we said, fundamentally, you know, the experience of the entrepreneur everywhere is kind of universal. Uh, And that's really the thing that matters. There's opportunity in rural areas. There's opportunity in, in, in urban areas. There's opportunity in poor countries. There's opportunity in wealthy countries. There's opportunity in poor neighborhoods. There's opportunity in wealthy neighborhoods. Um, And there's challenges in each of those two. Uh, They might sometimes be different. They might sometimes be the same, but that journey of the entrepreneur, the freedom that they have to figure out what's going to work in that and the risks that they bear are, are the same as well. Um, And, you know, you wrote about your book, Walmart, like uh, the world's, I don't know, second biggest company now in the middle of BF nowhere, Arkansas, no offense, Fayetteville, Um, uh, you know, great, Great businesses, great entrepreneurs can come from anywhere and grow anywhere. Um, the, it is this tremendously universal thing. So um, a question about what are your thoughts about the universal basic income as a way to encourage entrepreneurship? I, I don't know. I mean, there's, you know, I, I get asked this question. I also get asked about healthcare, being a Canadian. Um, I, I don't, I think it's being studied and then none of the studies are conclusive, whether it's that, whether it's other social safety net benefits. Um, there is this school of thought, uh, a very sort of libertarian, Ayn Randian, Milton Friedmundian school of thought, especially in the United States that says any sort of social safety net is anti-entrepreneurial. It's going to crush the entrepreneur. People want the complete freedom to do whatever. Um, And that doesn't necessarily come true. Uh, It's not all or nothing. You have tremendous entrepreneurs who built fantastic businesses in some of the most socialized countries and societies on earth. Ikea, for example. Um, uh, You know, I, I, on the face of it, yeah, would would that greater support help? I, I, I think so. I mean, I, you know, one thing for sure is like every entrepreneur I know hates paying taxes. I'm literally like a week late on my own taxes because I'm just, I don't hate paying it. It's just like, I just hate doing them. Um, uh, but the other is, you know, for example, here in Canada, like no one I know has ever considered healthcare as part of their calculus in starting a business. Whereas in the United States, many of my friends have not started businesses because they had to keep their job to maintain sort of health benefits in their family. Um, but there, there's a lot of research going on about this and it, it's, it's not yet conclusive. So um, another question asks how, how, uh, generalizable do you think the insights from your book are internationally you, as we spoke you know uh, already you, you did go down to argentina and uh yeah and visit a lot of wineries there and the like uh but what what's what's your sense of how well your book speaks to other experiences yeah i i, I think again it's it's universal and it, the story i was telling was not one that while most of the examples are in north america um uh 
you know, if you're in China, if you're in India, if you're in Guatemala and you're starting a business or working for yourself, you'll identify with the people in this and the lessons there because it's about that deeply human experience of being an entrepreneur. It's not a, it's not a how, it's not how to raise money. It's not how to start a business, not how to structure that. That changes from place to place. Um, it's about what it means to work for yourself. And I think wherever you are, that is, that is universal. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, I write a lot about immigrants, especially in this book. And for them, it's, it's this universal thing. You know, a lot of them were entrepreneurs in Syria and it's like, okay, well now we're entrepreneurs in Canada. Uh, we're going to do a completely different business, but you know, let's go. Um, that, that is something that's, you know, crosses borders very, very easily. But, but, yeah, mo most people don't realize that there's actually a thriving entrepreneurial economy in North Korea. Yeah, I think that 50 50% 50 of GDP or something like that is the Korean uh, entrepreneurial black market. Yeah, um, It's this thing that pops, you can't suppress it. I rem remember going to Cuba 20 years ago um, and going around Havana and like, you talk to someone, it's like everyone has a business. You know, you open up someone's apartment and it's like a gorgeous restaurant inside. It's like, shh, cut this way. Okay, yeah, cash only, US dollars. Don't like, don't, don't you know, it, it, it is... It, it goes back to the foundational act, economic activities of our society, which is like, well, I grew too much corn. So here in the Fertile Crescent, so like, let me walk into this, you know, nearest town in Sumeria and um, see if I can trade some of that corn for whatever. Um, wherever people are, you're going to see it. I mean, that's why even now in like the absolute worst, most restrictive economy, not just like economic devastation, but like so many restrictions because of the nature of, of this pandemic and people are like, okay, oh, this is terrible, but mm, I got an idea what's going to work. And it's like, boom, bam, you know, they're, they're off to the races. They're putting up a website. They're hanging out a shingle. They're painting a sign. They're, they're doing stuff. It is this. It is so tied into that that human nature of ingenuity and survival um, uh, and imagination. And that doesn't always, we always talk about that typically in terms of the big winners and the grand things in the in the in the long scheme of things. Um, but often it's just someone figuring out a way to to scrape together a living. Yeah. L literally every society. Uh, that had more than about a thousand people throughout history, going back 10,000 years, have had entrepreneurs. They, there yeah. were entrepreneurs before, when, when, when we were just hunter gatherers, there were hunter gatherer entrepreneurs. One guy gathered a little more. Yeah. He's like, yeah. look, you do a lot of hunting. Take a day off. Here's a <laughs> Actually, the Here's some dried antelope. Right. Well, actually, uh, the 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 farthest one I can find you know, actually created a bead factory for jewelry, and and had four different styles of beads that they produced in large quantities oh as hunter God. gatherers ten thousand years ago. The Diamond District of uh, <laughs> of, of, of Eastern Jordan. Eastern Jordan. Yes, the Rift Valley. Exactly. Um, that's exactly. It's, it is this. You know, like, uh oh, I love this. Every time on these crowdcast things, it's like <laughs> time. Yeah. Time. No, no, no. You guys were I just yeah. We are I getting was, up. I was the repeating the same point, anyways. These people yeah. all want to go home, and oh wait, you're all under curfew, apparently. So. We're all under yeah. A lot of New Jersey's under curfew right now. Oh, um, which I'm not sure Princeton is. I know where I am in Lawrenceville. We're under curfew. Um, I can't see the announcement for Princeton itself. Um, but yes, so um, I think we were about coming to the end of the great conversation anyhow. And uh, I love all the points that we touched on here and um, such a, a diverse conversation. And you guys are natural partners in this. It was a, a really nice exchange. It was great to see. So I just wanna officially thank you both for coming on here tonight uh, and giving this talk. And um, I answer the last question, I typed it in. What's that?
I typed in the answer to the last question. Okay. You typed in the answer to the last question. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Um, and this will be also up and available for replay here on Crowdcast. So you can come back and watch it again or point your friends towards watching it. Um, and of course, um, you know, you can order uh, The Soul of an Entrepreneur. And I do believe that Labyrinth also carries uh, Derek's books, which are also great. Um, Derek, did you come speak at the library when um, the, Bedrock, the Bedrock book came out? I thought you did, maybe for the Princeton Tech Meetup, which I see Chris yeah, Baraski yeah. from Princeton Tech Meetup is on here. Um, and the library works a lot with Princeton Tech Meetup, which is a really another great resource for entrepreneurs, whether you're techie or not. It's just a, an entrepreneurial community that meets, well, used to meet in person at the library, but we'll hopefully be doing that again soon. Um, we've been meeting for many years and um, a really supportive environment, no matter what kind of entrepreneur you might be. And we also, of course, have other, we work with a SCORE, which is the um, Service Corps of Retirative Executives at the library, does a lot of mentoring and tutoring um, and has helped. Uh, one of our, our big success stories is the Bent Spoon work through the library and our square mentoring services. And that's a great ice cream shop in town, David. So if you mm. uh, come to Princeton, I'm sure that Jennifer will insist you go to the Bent Spoon as we all do. One of the best in the country. And it is. Yeah, look them up, the Bent Spoon, like seriously. Look them up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. anyhow, so thank you for that. Oh, yeah. And uh, most of all, thank you again. Another a small business on here, um, you know, the Whole Earth Center and uh, Fran McManus for doing this and Jennifer for connecting us all. Jennifer, the great connector. And thank you for the book, another independent, you know, we, we, what, where would we be without our indie bookstores? And, um, Amen. you know, yeah. And Labyrinth is again one of the best in in, in the country as an as an indie bookstore. And, and I we're will say this about the indie bookstores. If you are on here and you're like, oh, I'm going to buy that book and I'm going to buy Derek's book too, but you know, oh, it's so easy to do on Amazon or blah blah blah. First of all, think about the value of Labyrinth to your community, and think about what it would be like to live in a community without a bookstore like them, because that's what's at stake now. But the other thing is, from everything that I've seen and heard over the past two months at this or month that this book's been out. Anyone who orders from Amazon waits three times as long than anyone who orders from a local independent bookstore. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get it faster. You're probably going to get it cheaper and your money is going to go to support something far greater than just, you know, Jeff throwing yeah. rocks in the space. And somebody who cares about your community. Or yeah. human. You know. Yes. And, um, Yes. Oh, and we have Esther from NJ Tech Weekly on here. She's a big supporter of our entrepreneurial community. She's always out at the library at our entrepreneur events. So this has been a really great conversation. So glad to be been able to hold this space. And um, we will look forward to future events. And um, so, David, if you ever come down to New Jersey once the border opens again, hopefully we can all meet up at the Bent Spoon for a bit of ice cream. That sounds wonderful. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Derek. Thank you to all my friends in Princeton um, and everybody who is watching here. Um, uh, I, I really appreciate it, especially tonight. Stay, stay safe, America. Okay, thank you. Hey, That's a great way to end. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.